This is Kate Spilee. I'm a public art and architecture critic in Washington, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Finding those buildings hasn't always been easy, particularly before the internet, if you can remember back that far. Before our phones were so full of Cardi B, TikTok, and $32 million inheritance offers, pending a $1,200 processing fee, of course, researching modernism meant spending time in real life deep in a major research library. Fortunately, the web has incredible resources and tools that you can use without leaving the comfort of your cool ranch Dorito-covered couch. Mmm, yummy. Today, we visit with two giants of modernism research, Bill Storr, creator of the Storr System for Frank Lloyd Wright Projects, and we welcome back one of our very favorite podcast guests, the maestro of modernism, the jolly green giant of Googie, the Samuel L. Jackson of architecture documentaries, the Ryan Seacrest of Modernism Week, hosting dozens of events, author and speaker Alan Hess. Later on, a few minutes with architect Frank Harmon reading from his book, Native Places. And now, just back from Walgreens, where he wired $1,200 to a, quote, attorney, unquote, named Mrs. Adele in Estonia. Tell her I love her records. Here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. Such a lucky day. $32 million through an email. Mm -hmm. I mean, like all of you, I get the inheritance scams all the time, from exiled Nigerian princes, dying Asian widows, and sketchy attorneys like Mrs. Adele and Estonia. These scams have been around just about since the Internet began. There's no way to stop them, and I've sure tried. When there's an unsubscribe button, which is rare, it only confirms my email exists, and then even more scams come in. Despite that, it's a good thing the Internet is such a handy tool for architecture research, particularly for pursuing our passion, modernist houses. Today, we'll talk with two of the best researchers in modernism, plus... We'll celebrate a very special 40th birthday. And a big shout out to the nation of Chile, where we just found out we are the number nine architecture and design podcast in the country. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskind. Frank Lloyd Wright scholar Bill Storr is clearly well-developed on both sides of his brain. He earned an engineering degree at Harvard and a master's in theater from Boston University. A few years later, he got his Ph.D. in comparative arts at Ohio University, polishing that off in just two years, including a four-month semester of World Campus Afloat. He's taught in high schools, colleges, and universities in New Jersey, South Carolina, New York, and Ohio. Bill went on to pursue the arts as manager of the Harvard Opera Guild and president of the Guild of Photographic Artists. He's researched his family's genealogy written original plays, composed musicals, produced films, given seminars, and exhibited photography. We know Bill because he took on the Herculean task of creating a complete Frank Lloyd Wright system of built works. That may seem easy now, what with the internet and everything, but his cataloging was sort of the Dewey Decimal System of Frank Lloyd Wright projects. If you've never heard of the Dewey Decimal System, just go ask your mom. Bill has lectured and written on Frank Lloyd Wright more than 50 years. His book, The Frank Lloyd Wright Companion, is still in print. And at the end of the show, we can get one of his books for free. Welcome, Bill. Well, welcome. And that's a long introduction as I've had in a while. Well, we try. Our research staff is uh, pretty much on the ball. Yeah, our bio writers get paid by the word. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best way to get a lot out of them. Yep. Alan Hess is our most frequent and popular guest. He has written, is it 22 books now, Alan? No, only 20. Only 20. 20 books, but I know that there are probably some in the pipeline. On modernism. Oh, yeah. And made countless appearances in architecture documentaries. He is an architect and historian, as well as the architecture critic for the San Jose Mercury News. He advocates for 20th century architecture preservation, going toe-to-toe with preservation board members who think that modernism is too recent to save. For instance, we know 
that Mies van der Rohe's grandson, Dirk Lowen, designed the original McDonald campus, a.k.a. Hamburger University, near Chicago. Well, Alan Haas helped keep the very first McDonald's in Downey, California, from being destroyed or ridiculously renovated, a feat for which he got a National Trust for Historic Preservation Honor Award in 1984. Coincidentally, 2021 is the 40th anniversary of the McRib, a treat (laughs) which appears at McDonald's periodically. Yeah. Just like the Before Sunrise movies with Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke, Haley's Comic, Beaujolais Nouveau, and decent Star Wars sequels. Welcome, Alan. Hello, George. Good to be back with you. So, Alan, uh, before we get started, a little pop quiz for you. Are you ready? Uh, Okay, yeah. Which architect said this? In 1930, critics ranted against the gloom, bad taste, and futile showiness of Victorian architecture. Today, the same shrill voices of urban misjudgment are telling us that the jazzy drive-ins and neon signs of the 1950s are worthless kitsch, red meat for the bulldozers of urban renewal. Okay, George, it's not fair to quote myself back to me. Uh, I forget what I have written in the past often, but it still sounds pretty good. It does sound good. That is an Alan Hess quote. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the best quotes of all time. (laughs) So, Alan, what is it about jazzy drive-ins and neon signs that people just don't quite understand? Uh, they're, they're, They're popular. People like them. People use them. They're part of daily life. They aren't, you know, a church you go to once a year or a uh, a state capitol or a high art museum. They are the buildings that everybody uses every day. And so we don't respect them, but we should, because many of the very best architects, including Frank Lloyd Wright, designed gas stations, motels, shopping centers, in the average buildings that everybody enjoys and uses. And those are what we should be paying attention to uh, as well. And googie architecture, the style of these wild neon signs and often food places, diners and burger joints and things like that, is very prevalent in L.A., isn't it? Yeah, it was really Los Angeles, the largest city in the southwest, where everyone started moving after 1945, the the growth of the Sun Belt really generated the opportunity for new types of architecture, uh, often oriented to the automobile. And Los Angeles, yes, because of its size and the talent, architectural talent that emigrated there or lived there, really developed Googie architecture as part of this new way of living, this new style of living. Now, Bill, let's start with you. We don't get many people on the show that have this qualification, but you actually met Frank Lloyd Wright, right? Yes. It was at Taliesin. My brother was an apprentice there, and my parents said, let's take the ferry across Lake Michigan, because we lived in Dearborn next to Detroit, and see what's going on there and why Bradley wanted to be there. And we were in the living room when Mr. Wright came out of his living quarters and was coming down the stairs in the living room. And my brother went up to him and said, Mr. Wright, I'd like you to meet my mother, my father, and my brother. And Mr. Wright looks at us and says, how do you do, mother, father, and brother? (laughs) Swirled his cape and headed across the living room to his chair. (laughs) No. So was this the inspiration to take up right, or did that come later for you? It came later. It came when I was doing my Ph.D. at Ohio University. Pete Goss, who became dean at the University of Utah, I believe, when he graduated, and I were doing the year-long history of architecture course under the direction of one of our mentors in the Ph.D. program. He said, the only way you'll ever learn this stuff is by teaching it to others. And it came up to Wright, and Pete said, your brother studied with Wright, so you must know something about him. You'll do the week. And I was stuck with going into the slide library and looking up things and trying to make some sense of Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Alan, let's go back in time a little bit. Do you remember before the Internet? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I I was alive then. (laughs) Okay. So, Alan, before we had the ease of the Internet, 
What were your go-to reference materials for putting together your books and just and just researching in general about architecture? It, it was very hard. You would have to go to specific libraries in um, in different cities where those architects were. Um, there was very little. There were, of course, books on many of the uh, the masters on Frank Lloyd Wright or Mies van der Rohe or people like that, Richard Neutra being another. But again, the question of how accurate they were was uh, always a question. So you always wanted to um, ideally try to confirm what those lists of buildings were. And um, then there were all of these other architects. And of course, one of my favorites, it was John Lautner, who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, he was working here in Los Angeles when I was living here. But there was a one-page printout that Lautner would give out of his buildings. But then there were all of these other ones that were not known, not listed uh, for one reason or another. So uh, just trying to find out who did what and when, and if the building was actually built, and if it still stood, these were very large challenges. Before you even got to the stage where you could look at an architect's career and all their work, and then make sense of it. You know, what's important, where did it come from, how did he, uh, he or she evolve, et cetera. So there was a lot of basic legwork that needed to be done on 20th century modern architecture before you could even begin to really make sense of what all was involved. Bill, how about you? Before the internet, what were your main tools for finding information? Well, uh, my only interest was, as you see, in Frank Lloyd Wright, though I've had a few other architects I've been interested in. There had been a published list in Writings and Buildings by Ben Rayburn and Kaufman Jr., quite inaccurate, with many listings that said the building was built and weren't, like one in Ludington, Michigan, that I knew wasn't built, and I still don't know why I knew it wasn't built. Huh. But the first thing I contacted was Bruce Pfeiffer, and I said, I want to do a catalog. And he said, well, he gave me sort of a list. And I went around and made photos of all the buildings I could. Everywhere I would stop, I would do my best to knock on the door and tell them what I was doing and why I was photographing their house. And they would say, do you know about the house over three blocks away kind of thing? And so I'd find a house that wasn't on Bruce's list. But the whole idea was that I'd come back with these photos, and Mrs. Wright would look at them and say, oh, those aren't good enough. And then she would tell Bruce, you know, and Bruce would be taking notes because they were going to do their own. So they were going to have you do the legwork and then take credit for it? Yeah. Hmm. Those bastards. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, eventually I realized that Ben Rayburn wasn't going to do this book. And strangely enough, at a college art association meeting in Washington, D.C., I was headed down the stairs to get lunch, and Edward Kaufman Jr. was directly behind me. And we got talking. I told him what I was up to. And he said, why don't you try contacting somebody else like the MIT Press? Okay. And I did, and that struck gold. And this was, what, 1969, 1970, thereabouts? Yeah, I really started the work in 69, completed it about three years later so that it could come out in 1974. I was a college teacher, and I was, had a free summer, and I just traveled during the summer. Alan, when did you write your first book? 1985. It was uh, Googie. Roadside Architecture. Roadside yeah. Architecture. And then what came along next? That led me to my second book, which was on Las Vegas. I had a chapter in my first book, Googie, about the architects who designed both Googie Architecture in Los Angeles and some of the earliest hotels, casinos in Las Vegas. And I discovered that there was a connection there, uh, just again, stumbled upon it in my research. 
and uh, always been interested in Las Vegas. This is a few years after Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown and Stephen Eisenhower had written Learning from Las Vegas, which really intrigued me. But uh, I wanted to know what were those buildings? Who did them? What did they look like? And there really wasn't any information you know, in a consistent way of answering any of those questions. So uh, that led me on to my second book on uh, called Viva Las Vegas, After Hours Architecture. So what was the first book you wrote where you had the advantage of the World Wide Web, that amazing new thing that came along? Oh, well, that would uh, be coming up into the 90s, really. And um, probably my book on uh, John Lautner, uh, the architect of John Lautner because I was able to use the internet at an early stage. It's really increased so much more then, uh, especially in the area of photo archives. There are now so many more photo archives that are available on the internet, and in, in university archives are listed, and you can go through those. Uh, some are better than others. But uh, that has made a real difference in recent years for my research on ranch house architecture and Palm Springs, certainly, and uh, other subjects like that, which had not really been researched or written about more before that. Now, along the way, did either of you, Bill or Alan, come across the Architecture Index book? The what? The Architecture (laughs) Index no, not the art index. It was the art index. No, the architecture index. I'm not sure I, I came across that. I think I've stumped the band here. Well, I'm going to tell you about this because our listeners will be able to use it as well. So way before the Internet, I believe back in the 50s, a fine fellow named Irv decided every year to subscribe to all the architecture magazines. And at the end of the year, he would index them all by project, location, and architect and publish his own book called The Architecture Index, which he would then sell to architecture firms as kind of a clipping service. You'd be able to look up the projects that got you media during the last year. And he put this out for, I think, almost about 50 years until the Internet came along and and took the wind out of his sails. Uh, We have the full run of The Architecture Index on our website at the U.S. Modernist Library, which has... Really incredible detail from a time that the Internet didn't exist. That's at usmodernist.org slash library, and just look for the symbol, the Architecture Index. Sounds like a a more recent version of Inland Architect. In a way, yes. Yes, absolutely. Bill, when did you start your store system for numbering right projects, and and how did that come about? Oh, gosh. (laughs) The catalog came out without any such numbering, and I'm just trying to think. I think it came when I went to University of Chicago, and we were working on the idea of the companion and had to have numbers. I really can't think of the date of when I actually... What is the companion? The companion is a much larger version of the catalog. It contain it's in black and white only, and I explain that because you only see depth in black and white, you don't see it in color. And it has not only an exterior identification photograph, but interior photos and plans. And it was doing the plans that was my whole idea for it, because nowhere could you get plans of every right building. You could get early right Prairie School, because that had been published. But the Usonian houses were sort of off limits, except for when Horizon Books did uh, did something on them, but then it was very limited. And I decided plans of all the buildings needed to be done, and I sort of blackmailed Bruce Pfeiffer <laughs> into giving me 8 by 10 photographs of buildings, when I told him, I, very simply, Bruce, I know you have never let these out, but I'm going to do a book, and it's going to have plans of everything. And it may take me some time to do it, because I'll have to drive around to them, but drawing a plan of a Usonian house is simple because of the grid. That very simple 4x4 four four square or diamond, I can just walk around the house and draw it. It'll take me a while, but then it will break your copyright. 
I was wondering if there was a copyright issue there. Yeah, when he heard those words, break your copyright, he said, Bill, I'll send you whatever you need. You get use rights. We keep the copyright. So all of my plans are still copyrighted by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. But I'm the only one who can sell them to anybody to use. Well, what do you know? Yeah, I make the money. Sounds like you had some great conversations with old Bruce. Oh, yes. We became very good friends. I would remember the first time I went out after this to Taliesin and West. He, was, he got to be very friendly. We got to be very good friends. Is he still around? Oh, no. He's died several years ago. He went there hoping to become an architect and very quickly realized that wasn't in him, but he had a knack for organizing things. So he took over the archives, and it was the best thing that ever happened to archival material. Creatives right. really need somebody to help them organize stuff. Yeah. That's a magic well, Pair. Anthony Lawson of the University of Texas, and a very close personal friend of mine, was the one who taught him how to number the things. He created the accession number system for Taliesin projects. And did that match your system of numbers? or? No, it was totally different. Mine was strictly for built work. Okay. And his was for everything, projects. It was projects year by year. Taliesin had a numbering system, but it was scattered around. It still exists and is still used because it's what was there. But its problem is the first two numbers are the year in which the project was created. So you put it in a computer and it's not in chronological order because it starts in the late 1800s. It goes into the 1900s. Oh, so, you know, a project in 1898 would uh, <laughs> soar towards the end of the list. Problem in 1901. Sounds like a Y2K problem. That's from right. 20 years ago. <laughs> a Y19. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Alan, Modernism Week is really the, the Super Bowl of modernism, it's the largest annual festival in the world. I think it really should be called Modernism 11 Days, but I won't nitpick. Um, <laughs> So Modernism Week due to the pandemic is in two parts this year, 2021, one virtual this past February and a limited live version here in April. You're on the board of Modernism Week, Alan. What was it like for your group shifting gears to adapt to the pandemic? Yeah, it was a real uh, real challenge. Uh, We got in our last in-person Modernism Week last February, fortunately, before everything shut down. It was more popular than ever before. And uh, then suddenly we have the lockdown. So um, our staff, and I just have to give an incredible amount of praise to our staff, uh, just kind of turned on a dime. And we realized that first for our October preview, that we probably weren't going to be able to have any in-person events. So what do we do? And we turn to the Internet and we decided to make Modernism Week available virtually and to recreate some of the experiences, some of the talks, some of the house tours that people would expect in in Palm Springs itself and to put that experience on the Internet. And as a result, I mean, you know, you, you have lemons, you make lemonade. It has allowed us to expand our audience because there are people who would uh, probably not be able to make it to Palm Springs in person, but uh, we could explain to them what Palm Springs Modern Architecture was about, uh, why it was important, give them part of the experience as much as you can through uh, video. So we came up last February with a uh, great collection of online experiences, house tours, everything from an interview I did, actually, with Jonna Ireland, who has been oh, yes, one of our past Paul guests. William. Yeah, great. great. Yes. And uh, so it's a conversation of what she has learned of studying Paul Williams' architecture firsthand through her camera. And then also, uh, I did a series called Desert Modernists, which are short 12 to 15 minutes on who these Palm Springs architects were and why they are important. But it's for the layperson, somebody who has no knowledge at all 
about Palm Springs or these architectures or even modern architecture at all and to uh, introduce them to it. So the pandemic has forced us to broaden our audience and introduce modernism to even more people than ever before. I know it must be a struggle financially and emotionally because of the the sheer amount of work that you guys produce every year to make Modernism Week happen. And then that helps fund projects throughout the Valley for the rest of the year. Yeah, that uh, is one of the main challenges. Uh, we had to completely rework our business plan, basically, and our sources of income and figure out what could we invest in? Uh, how much should we spend for video home tours, for example? And would it pay off? Because uh, Palm Springs Modernism Week is a nonprofit, and we share what money we make with a lot of our participating partners, uh, homeowners associations, historical societies, and other you know, local nonprofits. It's really incredible the amount of participation from those local groups during Modernism Week because they staff your events and they make the buses run on time, and it's just an unbelievable operation. It really is. Uh, There's such a spirit, such an appreciation, such an enjoyment of Palm Springs modern architecture among the uh, the people who live there and uh, just go about their daily life, but they happen to be in one of the, what I consider, one of the architectural uh, treasure troves of uh, the modern world. Well, let's go back to research. Bill, today, 2021, the Internet era, what are your favorite online resources for finding about information? Frankly, I don't use online. I use personal contact. Okay. So who's the best person to call? (laughs) <laughs> Depends on what I'm looking for. One of my closest friends is Anthony Olofsson. At, He's been on our show. Yeah, I'm sure. And he knows an awful lot about things that I'm interested in it because we approach right totally differently. So he's one, but I have a lot of other people there that some whose name is unknown. One is a person who lives in the Central Valley of California who just loves Wright, and he got an idea when taking my catalog and walking up to the door, knocking on it, and saying, your house is in this book. Would you please sign it for me? Oh. And the people would sign it and then say, oh, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's how we got to see it's all sorts of houses. always flattering to get asked for an autograph. It softens them up. <laughs> So I have people like that, you know, who just do things for me and let me know something has happened. It's a whole network of people out there. Maybe I couldn't even list all of them, I don't think. Alan, what are your favorite online resources for researching architecture? Well, Facebook, especially for photos, because the Internet has allowed people to scan their own personal photos or or the, the photos of their father who happened to be an architect and to post these on Facebook and certain, you know, groups. I'm I'm, uh, a friend with a number of the um, Frank Lloyd Wright organic architecture groups, certainly, but also modern architecture uh, in general, specific architects like Bruce Goff, for example, that I'm interested in. And uh, I discovered that there is a community out there who are also interested in those topics and then they share information and particularly photographs, which have been hidden or, you know, uh, in storage for literally decades. And they bring them out and post them. And those really are extremely valuable resources for me because they will lead, you know, let me know about a building that, you know, I never even knew existed but then I can follow up with other research uh, items to really figure out what it is and so forth. So that's part of what I did. And then, you know, I, if I may give a little uh, praise to U.S. Modernist as well in making all of these magazines from the past 100 plus years available, instantly accessible at my fingertips. I don't have to go drive to a library and see if they have 
Mark Stechel record from 1927 to 1935 or whatever. They're right there. And that just makes it incredibly easy. Because before the Internet, one of my main sources, of, for example, when I was in architecture school at UCLA, I would just go to the library and there were bound volumes of Architectural Record, Arts and Architecture Magazine, uh, Inland Architect, and I would just spend hours looking through those old magazines. And I, frankly, I learned an incredible amount from those, from the advertisements, as much as from the articles about buildings that intrigued me, that interested me, and that eventually would end up in a book I would write. Oh, yeah, the ads are great. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back, Alan, about your Facebook comment. So there are a billion messages a day, I don't know. So how do you and the messages connect? Is there a way you have alerts set up, or how do you find the information? Because obviously you can't read every Facebook message. Yeah, well, by just focusing in on and subscribing to, however they say it, a friend of uh, particular interest groups, one thing will lead to another, inevitably. So uh, you just start, and soon you go down the old rabbit hole, of course, and you spent uh, five hours. But at the end, if you're lucky, you have learned something about a John Lautner house, for example, that nobody knew existed. But um, somebody had a hint, somebody had a lead, and uh, sooner or later, you may be able to confirm uh, what it was all about. Do you use uh, Google Alerts or TalkWalker Alerts at all, Alan? No, no, I don't. I have to confess here, George, I am not a PhD like Bill is. I have not been trained in research methods. I'm I'm, uh, an architect. It Uh, sounds like Bill hasn't either. He just calls Anthony Olofsson and gets the scoop. (laughs) (laughs) And that's it. Still today in the Internet, personal contacts of people. And then the other key, talking to people is one, the other key absolute essential research thing is get out and drive around a lot. Just go and drive, especially here. Absolutely. Because you have to see this stuff, build up your memory bank in your head of what's out there. For example, the um, oldest remaining McDonald's stand in Downey that I nominated to, to the National Register of Historic Places. I drove by that one day in probably 1976, and I said, oh, there's one of the old McDonald's, and I noted it in my head. It was eight years later, I think, when I did more research, I discovered that that was indeed the oldest remaining original McDonald's stand in existence. But And I remembered I'd seen it, and I had a, had a slide of it. So, you know, over time, you piece these things together. Uh, One of my professors at architecture school, John Beach, his motto was, never pull a U-turn, always drive around the block. Uh That's good. you will discover, you know, something you never expected to around the block. So that's a big part of it. I will second that. Because I don't know how many places I've found, particularly a group in River Forest that nobody knew about, unless I had driven around the block. Now, Bill, you have an app. Tell us about the Right Guide app. What can people do with it? They can do an awful lot with it. It's only iPhone because it's the one thing that seems to work well. And they can go on and go to a state and see all these little red apostrophes, they can click on one and it will bring up the particular building and its location. And if they want to go there, they just ask Siri to take them. It's that simple. It will have every building. They can click on the building and get the essentially about half of the information that's in the catalog. Okay. I don't want to give them everything in the catalog because then nobody will buy the catalog. Right. (laughs) And this tells people, for example, whether a building is open for tours at any point or whether it's a private house, that kind of thing? Yes, that's all in there. So they, they can tell whether it's worth going to. They can tell whether it's visible from the road. Nice. Because some aren't. <laughs> and I should mention 
the right attitude on the Internet. This is run by Stan Eklund of Los Angeles. I believe he is a docent at Barnsdall House. And he runs this site, which is open to anybody who wants to come in, although he can ban somebody if, well, if sure. they make comments that don't work. So it's called The Right Attitude with a W, I assume? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. The Right Attitude, W-R-I-G-H-T, Attitude. It's the one online thing that I go to all the time. I have my computer set up so that if I am mentioned, <laughs> it tells me so, so I can just click and go up and see what somebody said. And if I feel that they said right or wrong, I can answer, I can support, I can dispute, whatever. And it seems, you know, my name is known by everybody in the right world just because of the catalog. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You are the John Bon Jovi of Frank Lloyd Wright. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll take that as a compliment. (laughs) Are you living on a prayer? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Uh, I'm not even living on the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Alan, Alan and Bill, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Before we go, Bill has a gift for all of our listeners. One of his Frank Lloyd Wright books from 1991 is now available online free at usmarnist.org slash resources. Just go there and download. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And now a few minutes with architect Frank Harmon, reading from his book, Native Places. Mrs. Ledoux, I'd been learning about ships, and she reminded me of a man of war, dreading nothing, able to sail anywhere. Her eyes could disable a smirk at fifty paces, and her hearing was unerring. She could hear a mouse in the grass and a boy saying ain't under his breath. My parents didn't like Mrs. Lena B. Ledoux, my fifth and sixth grade teacher. I adored her. Paired with my interest in boats was my passion for finding birds' nests. Mrs. Ledoux was the only teacher who let me look out the window. When I spotted a robin's nest in a dogwood tree, she was as thrilled as I was. John James Audubon was one of her heroes. Make a drawing of it, she said. When I did... She pinned it on the bulletin board. One of the most important people in our lives is the first non-family adult who recognizes our worth and uniqueness. Mr. Rogers said that the worst people in the world are the ones who try to make you feel less than. Mrs. Ledoux validated my love of bugs and balsa wood. She made me feel more than. Nowadays, my memory of Mrs. Ledoux is less dreadnought and more a thrush singing in the woods. She was, it turns out, an archangel. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin. Okay, Tom, it's time to press the ejection button. (laughs) Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3.1 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino, though not from Australia, researches guests while she glows, her husband plunders, and her daughters eat a Vegemite sandwich. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with another deep dive, love in the library, full-on design nerd-inspired edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.